Welcome to the second half of the day. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce to you uh, Eric LaBianca, uh, who works for Wiser Together and giving us a talk on cryptography. Please give him a hand. Thanks, everybody, for coming out. Appreciate it. Hope uh, lunch didn't make you too tired and sleepy. I'll try to keep you awake a little bit. Uh, just to start off a little bit, let me give you some background. Um, who am I? I'm really just a developer. I'm not a cryptographer. Uh, I'm here to have a conversation, uh, not to tell you uh, how to like solve the greatest problems in cryptography. Uh, we're going to talk about how to use it. Um, should you trust me? You know, in, in cryptography, you should never trust anybody. <laughs> Definitely not me. <laughs> so uh, in the questions, maybe someone will come up and tell me what I'm doing wrong, and then I'll learn something. I'd rather learn it from you than from some guy hack my site. So that's part of why I'm here. Uh, I work for Wiser Together. Uh, Wiser Together is a startup here in DC. We try to solve hard problems to give medical consumers peace of mind. We're hiring. Uh, come talk to me afterwards if you are so interested. Um, regardless of all that, should you pay attention? I think so, and I'm going to show you why. If you don't come away with anything else, this is the slide, OK? I want you to analyze your risks. You need to understand what's out there, and you need to understand that you're taking the risk or that you're going, to solve, you're going to try to have a control against it, OK? Don't write your own. Crypto is hard, and we're going to talk about why. Um, there are going to be cases where you need to. That's why you need to educate yourself first and operate correctly. Uh, finally, once you bite this off, you've got to commit. Uh, if you don't commit, you're probably not going to keep up. You're going to get out of date. Moore's Law is going to own you. So commit to keeping up. Why you should care. Uh, doing it wrong is really easy and common. Uh, the OWASP top 10, if you're not familiar with it, number A7, insecure cryptography. Unfortunately, cryptography does not come with cool labels like chainsaws. Uh, do not hold the wrong hand as a chainsaw. Okay, <laughs> awesome. Um, yeah, with crypto, you can do the same amount of damage, um, and that warning label just ain't there. Why you should do risk analysis. Uh, I don't know if any of you guys play games. Maybe you got some emails from Sony. Maybe you just saw it on the news. This is Information Week. It was all over the place. Um, they got hacked. I don't even want to talk about that. They, they had a million passwords exposed, uh, and they were in clear text. Uh, somebody didn't think about what the risk of losing their database was. Uh, you know, may, maybe they did, and they decided to accept the risk. I'm guessing their lawyers are telling them that wasn't such a great idea. Um, by the way, unique passwords are really cool. Secondly, the details are hard. Um, excuse me, wrong screen. Uh, rolling your own is hard. Uh, LinkedIn, okay, I, maybe some of you guys are, you know about them. Um, they had 6.46 6 million passwords leaked online. And what do you know, uh, they were not hashed correctly. And so people have been cracking them all over the place. They had the clean egg off their face. It was interesting uh, when they sent out their uh, kind of mea culpa they said, oh, we're using this new technology called hashing. It's like, <laughs> really? Thanks, guys. Um, uh, so anyway, we'll, we'll talk more about some details there. Finally, the details are hard. This goes back really far. Uh, Wikipedia's got a great article about the Enigma machine. Um, they say this is why we won World War II. Um, the Enigma machine basically was a really good crypto machine. But the problem is, if you didn't choose your key, your uh, initialization vector correctly, uh, it was susceptible to known plain text attacks, and we owned it. Um, that was really just a training and documentation problem. The cryptography was good. That's what I'm going to try and help you know, to avoid. Keeping up is hard. Maybe you heard about Gawker. Um, they actually were encrypting their passwords, and they were assaulting them. It, the problem was they were using crypt. Uh, it's really old, and it had, I think I want to say 12 bits of data stored, so modern computers just own it. And so once their password database was leaked, it's all over the internet, go change your password. So again, uh, you've really got to commit to keeping up. This is a great reason to use Django and to keep follow, you know, use the latest Django. We'll, we'll talk about that too. Please use a password manager. Finally, attacks are mechanized. I mean, this isn't, this isn't news, but compared to the Enigma days, now we have FireSheep. I mean, everybody, every kid in high school downloads this thing, puts it on, they're Firefox, and they're sitting there in a the coffee shop owning you. So really, if you're doing anything that involves interesting information, you've got to recognize someone's going to come up with a way to own you. And so you need to, stay, you need to do your best to stay ahead of it. Um, and things, even things you know, we'll talk about, like timing attacks, they seem really hard. But 
All it takes is one smart guy with too much time. He's going to write a mechanized attack, and next thing you know, you got Fire Sheep and any idiots running the thing. So you just don't want to go there. All right, so why you should do it. I'm just curious. This is more for my edification than, than yours, but also maybe help wake you guys up. Um, show of hands. How many of you have used hashlib, md5sum, or another hash function? All right, good. Almost everybody. Awesome. Uh, how about set up TrueCrypt, Lux, FileVault, BitLocker, or another sy symmetric cryptography system? All right, so we're about, mm, maybe almost 50%, so that's pretty good. How about set up a web server to use HTTPS or some other service using SSL or TLS? Okay, pretty good. It's about a little over half, maybe. Uh, how about use PGP or SMIME? Okay, so we're getting out a little, little less than half. How about configure a certificate authority? All right, pretty good chunk. So we've got kind of a mixed, mixed bag here. I, I build this as a novice talk. So I, for those of you that have done all this stuff, I, I apologize. You may not learn a whole lot in the first half. We do have some fun examples, and I'm happy to talk with you in the hall, too. Um, all right, so this is my obligatory CISSP 101 slide. I, I had several. You can thank me after. This one does have a cartoon. And I really do think risk analysis is important. If you get into the security game, you need to do risk analysis. Um, <clears throat> I don't, you probably can't read it. Two dinosaurs are sitting there and says, all I'm saying now is the time to develop the technology to deflect an asteroid. Now is the time to think about security, not after you got owned. <laughs> uh, so basic risk analysis. It's not easy, but it's actually pretty simple. Okay? Inventory or assets, what are you trying to protect? What are the things that would either cost you to lose or someone else might want? Data. I mean, you know, names and addresses go a long way. By the time you're starting to talk health information or any sort of universal identifier, driver's license, SSNs, medical plan numbers, um, you probably want to protect those. Uh, systems, you know, generally you don't want other people logging into your web server. It's, it's, it's inconvenient, so you should protect them. Uh, identify vulnerabilities. We're, so now you know what you were trying to protect, how you're going to lose it. Um, someone could come and steal your backups. You know, backups are a really tough problem, actually. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about it, but you, you should be backing up security and you know, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Availability means you've got to have backups. So you can't just not, but yet you also need to protect them. So you need to be thinking about when you're talking about cryptography, how does that integrate with your backups? People lose laptops. Um, I think it was yesterday, Anonymous leaked a million Apple UDIDs. Um, they're claiming that they got a, they, they cracked a laptop that was owned by the FBI. FBI is the United, who, who knows, but um, laptops are like this huge problem because you, you lose all your physical security. Um, compromised systems, obviously people get owned, it happens. Uh, insecure networks, you know, you really have to trust. If you're not encrypting along the way, you got to trust everything. Wi-Fi is obviously the worst case, but uh, it's really not that hard to stick a trunk port on a switch and, and take over that way. Um, employees and customers, you know. Guy quits, he's mad, rm minus rs slash, boom. Uh, you, you probably want to have something in, in place to prevent that. Um, so then you kind of identify what your vulnerabilities are. Um, you look at the risk and you say, OK, what am I going to do about it? Analyze controls. Um, one easy one, and I mean, I, I, this is one of my favorite, is destruction. Stop collecting. <laughs> you got something bad, people might want it, stop collecting it, make it go away. Um, if you can, it's an easy way to do it. Uh, another way is a lock safe. Um, you know, they say an air gap is the best security you can have. Don't, don't get things on the network if you don't have to. And finally, cryptography. It, it is a pretty good control. Um, and we'll talk about some of the easy ways to do it. There's some real kind of basics I think everybody should be doing. And then there's, there's some more advanced stuff where you're really kind of taking your life in your hands. Um, so apologies for the security 101. So let's talk about um, cryptography a little bit. Cryptography is a big field. goes back uh, quite a while. Um, from our perspective here for web apps, there's really three types of cryptographic algorithms. Uh, and we're going to talk about all three of them. The first one is, is a hash function. Looks almost, almost everybody had used one, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time about it. You, you, uh, here, here's how you can do it in Python, right? Hash lib, SHA-224. Put something in there, get a hex digest, you get another string. So a hash is a function that takes some input and makes a fixed length output. There's how to do it with OpenSSL on Nice place to play to hash browns. Um, it has some properties that are pretty interesting. Uh, you don't use keys with a, ha with, a, with a hash function. It's easy to compute the hash value or the digest of any message. So it's usually pretty fast. That's an important thing. File that away for later. 
it's very hard to generate a message for a known hash value. So you say, I've got a hash, ABC, I'm gonna create a message, XYZ. It doesn't, if it's a good hash, you can't do that. If it's been broken, you can't. <laughs> Modify a message without changing the hash. So if I say, hey, I sent you a message and it had a hash of ABC, and you get the message and you got the hash of ABC, if it's a decent hash, you should know that the message that you have is the same message I had. No one changed it on the way. Finally, it should be really hard to find two messages with the same hash. Obviously, it's possible, right? The key space of the message is a lot larger than the bit length of the hash. So, I mean, there's infinite possible messages, and there's only, you know, depends, 128, 512, 256 bits of uh, information in the hash. So it is possible, but it should be very hard. Um, what do you do with them? You can use it to verify integrity of files. I just talked about that. Uh, the Django session and cookie signing. Uh, uses HMAC hash. Um, it's, Django 1.4 actually has a really nice signed cookie function. You should use it. Um, SSL, TLS, HTTPS. Um, we'll talk about that in more detail. But again, you want to verify the integrity of the packets you're getting. Password verification. Uh, caveats apply. Use Django. We'll talk about it more later. Uh, reliable identification of unique files. Probably a lot of you guys use Git or Mercurial, I hope. Um, those hashes, those unique, weird strings, those are all hashes, and they actually identify this, at least in Git, they identify the state of the tree at any given time. Uh, so it's, a, it's just kind of this handle. It's really cool. Uh, you also can use a hash function for generating pseudorandom bits. Um, that means you can get a lot of bits out of one random initial value. And again, talking about that, Django 1.4 has some good stuff for you there. Um, extra credit, this, there's a slides link at the end. Uh, Wikipedia article's good. Um, and RFC 2104 uh, is HMAC, and there's some good stuff in there, too. All right, symmetric encryption. This is kind of, I think, what people think of typically when they're thinking of encryption. Uh, you and I, we both have a key. You gotta have, um, share the key somehow. That's the hard part. Uh, but then you can send stuff back and forth, and if no one else has the key, if it's a good encryption algorithm, no one else can get the data. So you, you take a message, and you dump it in with a key, and you get junk out, and so, that's an example, typing it in with OpenSSL, pretty nice little toolkit, um, using AES and a hard-coded key. You know, take, take it for it as easy. Um, symmetric encryption has a bunch of properties. It's reversible, unlike a hash. Hash is one way, right? You lose the data. Um, it requires a shared secret, kind of inconvenient. You can use it for encrypting anything, files, backups, file systems, transmission. Uh, there's a lot of algorithms. D DES, I hope you're not using DES anymore. Um, a one-time pad is actually super, super effective. The only problem is you need a one-time pad for every transmission. It's as long as a transmission. Uh, good luck exchanging those. Um, AES, that's kind of my standard. It's certified. Government's got a lot of money making sure that either they have a back door or it's really secure. Hopefully, I'm, I'm hoping the latter. Um, it's hardware optimized. Uh, this is a Sandy Bridge laptop, I think, and it's got AES. We call them AES NI instructions. Makes it super fast, so good reason to use AES. And then uh, Blowfish is another one that's out there. You'll see it. It's good. I, I don't, I, you know, like I said, I'm not a cryptographer. I can't really compare the two. I think Blowfish, um, a derivative of it was very close in the run, as a runner-up for the to be the AES. So I think it's a good algorithm. Um, the implementations in Python, uh, basically two options for symmetric encryption: uh, M2 Crypto, which is an open SSL wrapper. That's kind of my preferred option, just because OpenSSL is pretty well vetted. Now, everybody says the code base is a mess. I, I can't, can't say I've really done much with it, but I can tell you that they've managed to get the darn thing FIPS certified, which is not an easy thing to do. Uh, PyCrypto is written, I think the primary author is European, so he doesn't think FIPS certification is so cool, and he doesn't want to limit himself to that, so it's not certified. It is a little more Pythonic. I, I think as long as you're not dealing with regulatory stuff, Pick whichever one you like. That's cool. Finally, this is the holy grail, public key cryptography. Uh, read, I think it was Wikipedia, they were quoting somebody, it's a big one in the field, and he said, public key cryptography is the biggest breakthrough in cryptography since the invention of cryptography because it's asymmetric. I can give you, oh, excuse me, a public key. You can give me your public key. We can exchange information, and you're the only person that can read my message, and I'm the only person that can read yours. There is no other way to do that. Public key cryptography gives you that, and it also gives you the ability to verify and assign. So you can see if you've got an original clear text, Bob's got a private key, and he's got Alice's public key. 
He encrypts against Alice's public key, and you get a ciphertext. Uh, he can sign with his own private key, and he gets a signature. And then on the other side, Alice, she's going to have Bob's public key, and she has her own private key. She can decrypt with the private key and verify that this message actually came from Bob. Pretty cool stuff. And you get a clear text, a verified clear text out the end. A um, couple of properties, lots of complex keys. That's really the killer. Uh, when you, how do you move them around? How do you work with them? How do you generate them? It's slow. Uh, the way that this works is it uses properties of mathematical properties that are faster to, to calculate than they are to reverse. So, for instance, finding the two prime factors of a very large number uh, or uh, calculating the logarithm of very large. Ex exponentiation is fast, logarithms are slow. So, RSA uses multiplying primes, uh, DSA uses exponentiation and logarithms. Uh, they have to use very large numbers to calculate it out the first way, and you're relying on it being always a lot slower to calculate it back. So it is a solvable problem, so you have to stay ahead bitwise. Um, what do you use them for? Key validation. Uh, certificate authorities, web of trust. If you ever download, you know, you go to a website and you pop up that thing and it says, I don't know who this is. Do you want to accept it? Sometimes it won't even let you. That's because the public key, you don't trust that public key. And so it said, I, I got this public key, I don't know what to do with it. Sorry. Um, so you use it for key exchange to set up an SSL, TLS, to HTTPS connection. Um, secure anonymous uh, asynchronous transfers. So email, email encryption. S-MIME, I, I don't really understand why, but every email client seems to come with S-MIME support, yet no one uses it. Uh, and then everyone uses PGP instead, which is, anyway, it's ironic. But they're actually this, basically the same encryption technology. Uh, it's just a different way of trusting keys. Um, it's also a nice way to encrypt a file. You know it's encrypted on disk. You know it's encrypted in transfer, transport. You don't have to think about it anymore. Cool stuff. All right, so putting it all together, the real table stakes, in my opinion, is you need to run HTTPS. If there's any reason at all why someone might want to hijack your sessions, you should be running HTTPS, even naively. Better than nothing. <laughs> this is how HTTPS works. The client sends a request to the server and says, hey, I want, to initiate SS I want to initiate SSL. Here's what I prefer. The server says, OK, sends back its public key. Client looks at the public key and says, do I know this public key? That's where that message pops up. And so you've actually got a list of known root certificates that are allowed to sign the public key. And if you're not signed by those, that's when you get the pop up. It says, unknown cert. You've got to add it. Assuming the client likes the, cert, the public key that it got or you overread it, um, the client says, OK, let's agree on, a, on an encryption key. And it, it, it uh, suggests a, a, what they call pre-key, sends it back to the server. And the server then creates a session key, which is going to set up a synchronous, uh, excuse me, a symmetric encryption. So you're going to use AES. You're not going to use, you're not going to keep using public key. You're now switching over to, sy to symmetric encryption. They both generate a session key, and then they transfer packets. And each packet is encrypted and it's verified using a hash. So actually, all three of those technologies are happening in that, I want to say, less than 100 milliseconds it takes for you to set up a single HTTPS web request. Pretty amazing. Some more references there if you if you're care to dig into it some more. I, I did skip a step. You can actually, the server can ask the client to verify its own certificate, and hardly anybody does it, so I skipped it. So doing it right, table stakes. This is the basics. Um, Django really does a good job with crypto. Most of those password exploits I've talked about earlier, uh, if you were using Django, 1.3 is pretty solid. 1.4 is really solid. You really wouldn't have to worry that your database got sent around the internet because Django does such a good job. The second thing you can do is keep the settings secret key a secret. Django uses that to verify authenticity of various things. So the better, you can do it, the better job you can do of protecting that, the more secure your Django install is going to be. Turn on, H on HTTPS. Uh, it's relatively easy to do. At least like half of you had done it. I'm happy to show you how. There's lots of things on the web. Even if you got to use self-signed certs, still turn it on. It'll still protect you from FireSheet. Um, and finally, and this is kind of a tricky piece, is you need to tell Django you're using HTTPS. Uh, and in any, you know, I don't, I don't know about you guys, but I tend to use maybe too complex um, deployment architectures, and so I got front-end servers and proxies and load balancers. And typically, one way out in the front is running HTTPS. And then you wind your way into the back end, and then Django doesn't know 
that you're running HTTPS, and so then you can't use this request.issecure. So the answer is the secure proxy SSL header. I think that's new in 1.4. There's also lots of little hacks you can do to do this. You really need, your, your Django app needs to know that it's behind security, otherwise you're gonna have problems. The other thing is you really need to redirect to HTTPS. If you turn on HTTPS and you're not forcing connections to it, then people have the option to just totally screw themselves. And I, I, I don't know, I mean, I guess there's good reasons to not do that, but unless it's gonna like, yeah, I don't know, I don't, I don't wanna go into what those, re, those reasons are. Your risk analysis should tell you, otherwise default to <laughs> enforcing HTTPS, how's that? So this is where it gets hard. Um, there are lots of things you might want to do. You don't get for free with Django. You don't get for free with your web server. But you might need to do it for business reasons. Hopefully your risk analysis is informing this. Protecting private data via secret key cryptography. Um, maybe you've got a user profile record and it has somebody's medical records on it. Or maybe you're in financials and you've got someone's, I don't know, tax history or whatever. Maybe you aren't deploying to a server that you can trust or you want a defense in depth, so you need to encrypt that stuff. That's not, you know, Django doesn't give you that for free, so you gotta figure out how to do it. We'll talk about it. Uh, supporting encrypted payloads. So it's great, we can send something from point to point, um, but we need to somehow exchange keys. So this is a really useful case. I mean, someone's got a lot of data, they wanna send it to you. you, know, you can. Zip actually has a little encryption function. You can do zip and you know, my password and send it. Uh, again, how do you exchange the key? And typically, we're writing web apps. We want it to be automated. So calling me up and saying, hey, the key is one, two, three, four, it's probably not gonna work so well. So we'll talk some more about that. Uh, using full disk boot volume encryption. So that's you know, file vault, lux, truecrypt, um, bitlocker. Uh, again, how do you provide the key? I, I, don't, I don't know about you, I haven't set up a physical server in a couple of years now. Unfortunately, providing keys to cloud servers is a really thorny problem. We'll talk more. Um, extra credit, even if you're running HTTPS, you really ought to check out uh, the FIPS, NIST, NSA recommended configurations. They really eliminate a lot of the BS because it is, it is really easy to do wrong. If you're serious about it, you ought to check out what they're recommending. So let's talk about things people do. And unfortunately, since everybody does this wrong, I felt like and I, excuse me, I, I jumped, I've jumped into this problem before. Um, so I just wanna show you why you shouldn't do this. So this is a really dumb Python example, right? You got a, a table of users, Bob, Alice, and Eve. Uh, Bob and Eve have the same, same password, yay them. Um, so we think, oh, I'm gonna be smart, I'm gonna hash my passwords. This is, what, this, this is LinkedIn. Um, so what do they do? They run SHA-224, you get a hex digest. I truncated eight characters, you obviously don't need to do that. Um, but what happens? Bob and Eve have the same hash password. So that means you can brute force the entire password file in one pass. That is a problem when the password file is large. <laughs> because suddenly, they don't have to just pick you and burn you down. They can just brute force. And I mean, most people, the, one of the interesting things that came out of that Sony hack, they did a bunch of research on what kind of passwords people use. The average, like over 50% of the passwords, I wanna say, were under six characters. I mean, people use, people will pick terrible passwords if you leave it up to them. So if you allow someone to brute force your entire list, they're probably gonna own half of it in a couple of days. So just don't do that. It's really easy to do better. Django does it better for you. And this is what Django, this is basically the Django 1.4, um, oh, excuse me, two screens. Uh, the Django 1.4 uh, password hashing. I, I just recently, I just kind of was preparing for the talk and I was digging around in their code and 1.4 uh, is actually a lot better than 1.3. I don't, I don't know who wrote that code, but um, round of applause for them. I mean, they did, <laughs> I was really impressed. <laughs> so <clears throat> this is the basic routine here. You, you, um, you encode, you get a random string and you use it as a salt. Uh, the random string, there's a new random string function in 1.4. It ties into system. Uh, excuse me, random.systemrandom which hooks up to dev u random and it gets real entropy. So you're gonna use a salt that is, should be actually random, which is really cool. Uh, and then they use what's called a key derivation function. Uh, in this case, they've chosen pbkdf2. Uh, the, these are very special functions designed for encrypting passwords. They're very slow, they're computationally expensive. And the goal here is to make it even harder to brute force. Uh, 
uh, and you actually tune the number of iterations to try to keep the time slow, but not so slow it's annoying to your users. Really cool feature. You should be using it. Um, again, you get it for free with uh, Django 1.4, so get on that. Um, and you can see you verify it. Basically, you split. So you store the, sat, the, uh, the algorithm and the, the, uh, the salt and then the hash value in the database table. And then to verify, you split it all back out and you rerun the algorithm reusing the salt that was stored in the table. What this means is that every password is hashed with a unique value. And if you're going to try to brute force attack this thing, you've got to do it one row at a time. With a slow function, you know, 100 years from now, I'm sure you'll be able to rip through it. But for the foreseeable future, it's going to be really inconvenient. So you can see what happens. They're using a good function. Uh, and now, both Bob and Eve, they still got their lame same password, but the hashes are different. So you can't just pre-calculate everything, rip through the list, and say, oh, Bob and Eve both have secret. Let's own them. <clears throat> There's one thing that they didn't do, and that is using HMAC. So they didn't actually bring in their own uh, salt value. That everything is random. You can bring in another piece of information, basically like the Django settings.secret key. Um, this library, I found out about this yesterday. Uh, if, you, if you didn't make it to uh, James Sokol's talk, lots of good overview stuff there. And he turned me on to this library that actually does that. Uh, it uses HMAC, and it also uses some alternative algorithms to PK, uh, PK, PBKDF2. So something good to check out. So a couple other examples. Um, this is where you actually go into the world of writing your own. And I apologize in advance. It's not. It's a, it's a bad place to be, and I, I was there, which is part of why I'm here. I, I've, I've made these mistakes, and I'm still trying to figure out if I've, if I've got it right. So hash record lookup. We, we get lists of people. Uh, it's like, kind of like a whitelist, right? People that can use the site. And they're, they're huge. They've got information I don't want to have. So what we do is we actually hash them. And we hash them against assault. So we say we've got all these people. You see they've, Bob's got a, a key, right? Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, uh, and we're going to hash that. So we don't actually store the information we don't want. So we we get the file, we load it up, stuff in the table, hashed. And then when Bob shows up, we can say, "Hey, Bob, um, okay, you've logged in, but to access your good information, we need to authenticate your account. What is your driver's license number?" And the, he plugs it in. We know the secret value, and we go look it up and see if he's in our table. And then we can pull some other values for him or whatever, or just let him have access. Uh, the benefit here is if we can prevent whoever, if someone steals our database, uh, as long as they don't actually have access to the code, they are pretty much SOL trying to break this thing. So it's, it's a little added layer of security. Um, it's a good thing to do. OK, here's an example uh, of doing symmetric encryption. I'll show you what we use this for. This is using the M2 crypto library. It's a little obtuse. It's really not, the, not that hard. You, you, you import the, the darn thing. Um, you set up a Cypher object. And you call update a bunch of times. And then you call finalize. And then you base64 encode the output. And then decrypt is basically the other way. They got this magic value, 0 and 1, to tell it whether or not you're encrypting or decrypting. Um, <clears throat> the key thing that I want to point out to you here, and this is, again, talking about pitfalls, OK? So with hashes, you really should salt. Unless you know you don't need to salt, you should be thinking, what, how should I be salting this hash? For inc symmetric encryption, you need to be thinking about initialization vectors. I've had several people that I'm exchanging crypto credentials with, and they're like, oh, yeah, we'll just here use this initialization vector. You just like totally cut the legs out from under your crypto. Um, the Wikipedia page on initialization vectors has a picture <laughs> of a Linux penguin that was attacked out of an ongoing stream. Uh, by because they were someone was not using random initialization vectors. This is a great reason to using Django. You got this new get random string function. Stuff it in as your uh, initialization vector, uh, and you know that you can't. The, the encryption is no longer subject to a known plain text attack. Again, this is this is stuff that people spend hours and hours and hours, days, weeks, and months figuring out how to crack. If you all it takes is for you to put one in there instead of it's like oh what, what do I put in here? I'll try one. Oh it worked. I got crypto. <laughs> Unfortunately, anybody that cares is going to be able to break through that pretty darn fast. So this is a good thing to know, initialization vectors. 
So this is something that we've done that uses that. So this is kind of like a poor man's single sign-on. Uh, we, we got customers that have you know, portals, they've got known users, and they need to hand that user off to us. They don't want to give us every, all of their information, and they don't want people to have to log in again. So this is a way we agree on a key. This is really simple code, but we, they basically give us a JSON blob with the user credentials. We look it up. Um, so you can see, basically, this is a, a really simple view. Uh, we pull in an initialization vector as a get parameter, and we pull in an encrypted token. Um, we decrypt the token, and then dejson it. And then we try to look up a user. If it wasn't found, you create it, you authenticate him, and you log him in. So, and, and it works. Now, I'll tell you, don't use this code, because the production version has about 500 conditionals and exception handlers. <laughs> There's a lot of places you need to catch. Um, you know, user wasn't found, user's already logged in, stuff like that. Um, but that's the basic flow, and it's a really nice, simple usage of a um, symmetric encryption to do something useful. Um, it, it's, it's really lightweight, and you know, we've had people implement this algorithm with at least three different other programming environments, and they just, we give them good docs and they do it. So it's, it's, it's actually pretty low barrier to entry. Um, so final thoughts. Uh, key management. Th this is like the killer problem, at least in the modern cloud world in my book. Uh, I, don't, I don't actually have a great solution to it, and I, I, I'm hoping maybe you guys have some suggestions and we can talk. Um, but the problem is, how are you going to make keys available to your app? You know, Django's got that setting, settings, that secret key. Um, they use it for a bunch of stuff. You, know, you can keep your hard drive relatively secure. And what, but as soon as you are operating under the assumption that either your backups or your machine might be compromised, you need your keys to at least live in memory. Ideally, they're on a physical device. Smart cards, HSMs, I mean, like the government has all kinds of amazing technology that defense contractors use to keep keys out of memory. Uh, you know, cloud servers, that's just not, doesn't fly. So what you can do is you can put them in memory. Um, how do they get there? Well, you gotta provide them at boot time or on request. Um, this is a way you can get them out of memory. Um, GPG, which is the GNU implementation of PGP. So it's public key encryption. Um, it has an agent program, kind of like SSH agent. I, I didn't mention SSH is obviously has the option to do basically the same public key stuff. Um, and so what you can do is you can fire up the agent, load up your keys, unlock them, and then have your Django app just use GPG and say, hey, decrypt this file, and you can load your keys from it. So it's better than nothing. I think if someone was able to snap your memory they could probably pull the key out. I don't know how they wouldn't be able to. So it's not ideal, um, but at least that way you don't have to worry about backups, and they kind of have to know what they're doing. So it's kind of a really poor man's solution to key management. Um, obviously what you don't see in the example there is how do you configure your GPG key ring? Um, how do you load the keys? How do you unlock the key ring? Those are all a little bit complex problems. We're actually working on an open source uh, project. It's, it's on GitHub, but I'm not even gonna tell you where it is because it's. It's, it's, not, it's still half-baked. But it's basically a Django app uh, that wraps GPG agent. And so you can load up keys, store them, and then where we want to go with it is it'll actually like send you a text or something out of band. So the server can say, issue a request and say, hey, I'm server one. I want the key to unlock Eric's email. Um, and then it'll say, you know, look at the IP address, and it'll say, oh, yeah, you're authorized for the next hour. Or say, no, I don't know who you are. And so they like, send me a text and say, this server has been bounced, it's trying to get access to this key, and then I can either text it back or push a button or something like that. Um, there's actually, I think there's some commercial products to do it. It's, it's actually a really simple problem, so um, I'm hoping that we can just make a little Django app, call it good. So anyway, any questions? A um, bunch of contact information for me, uh, some good resources. There's a link to the slide deck uh, if you want it. Like I said, I work for Wise Together. Uh, we do some pretty cool stuff, and uh, we're hiring. So, thank you. Are there any questions? So, uh, Less of a question, more of a deliberate prod. Uh, <laughs> there, uh, HSTS and HTTPS. Um, can we just talk about how you should 
probably always use the former, the, the two together there, so we can avoid all those offline or the man in the middle attacks with this. Um, it, meaning like the the header, right? Yeah. Yeah. The, so right. So there's a header you can send with your request that says this URL is only supposed to be accessed via HTTPS. Use it. That's what you were looking for, right? <laughs> yeah. I should I, I should put that in there. Use it or else. Anything else? Uh, this isn't actually a question. I just wanted to say that at uh, 3 o'clock in Washington A, uh, in one of the open spaces, I set up a, a PGP, GPG key signing party. So if anybody wants Sweet. to come and get key signing, yeah. then, uh, come on by. That's during the break, so it's not conflicting. Yeah, with thank you. Anything. Hi, yeah, just a little bit. Uh, I just had a question about what you, you spoke towards the end about unlocking uh, block devices on a, sh on a shared machine right. in quote unquote the cloud. And I guess the question I had is that. Uh, I mean, obviously you don't. Obviously you don't want to place your shared key directly on the machine because that's really no different than just placing your data on encrypted. Right. Uh, but at the same time, having any credential on the machine by which you could decrypt a payload that contains a share code is really just the same problem. And I, I guess I'm a little bit confused as to what you are, how you are proposing addressing that problem, other than some form of manual intervention, where I actually go and say, yeah, you know, just some out third, excuse me, second party channel by which I say, this machine is actually mine. So I, I, I'm proposing making that easier. <laughs> Otherwise, it's manual intervention. So basically, what you, the, the use case would be you've got a startup script. It knows where your Lux device is, and it knows a URL to hit to get its key. So it hits, it hits a URL with curl, and then curl blocks. The server then texts me and says, hey, this server's booted up. It thinks it wants this key. Should I give it to it? And then I can click a button rather than having to SSH in and unlock the device. Okay. Otherwise, it's the same. We're talking about the same thing. It's just making that easy, the, the manual intervention a lot easier. Because right now, that's what we do. We log in and go unlock keys. And the problem is the machine gets bounced. Uh, you know, I, I got to have SSH. I got to have the VPN. I gotta, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot harder to, to deliver the key. Thank you. Should I be using um, Django's hashers for hashing cache keys? Django's hashers for hashing cache keys. I, 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 don't, I don't think so. Okay. Um, they're going to be very slow. Um, I, I can't really think of a reason why you'd want to do that. Um, okay. I mean, ge generally, so a non-cryptographic hash, the, the point is to create kind of an identifier handle, and you really want it to be fast. In the case of a password, that's where you want it to be very slow. Um, other, other than that, I don't really think, I don't know. Some, someone can correct me if I'm if I'm being silly, but I, I don't think you need to. Okay, thank you. Yep. Cool. Thank you, everybody.